All right, today we are talking all about the tools you need to succeed in publishing all the way through from plotting and planning and writing your book through to exporting it, formatting it, uploading it, getting the covers done, and of course, getting started with marketing too. So building your platform, getting your website sorted, and building up your email list. We're gonna look at all the essential tools today, so let's go. I was just gonna sit down at my desk and introduce a few of my favorite tools to you, but why not do it in the field? So I was instructed to go water the horses, so I figured well, why not just do the quick intro um, here instead and hopefully not get trampled. Now, um, one of the things I wanted to say about this before we jump onto the computer is that I'm gonna show you some of my favorite tools, um, and this is after several years of using many, many different ones, ranging from free, cheap, to very expensive, and these are the ones I found that I like the best, and sometimes they're at the more expensive end, sometimes at the cheaper end, uh, but they suit my kind of usability case uh, more than others. Now, you, might, you may find that some of them aren't quite right for you, and that's absolutely fine, um, but as long as you have something that enables you to get the end result, it doesn't really matter what software you use. I, mean, I see this um, kind of argument and debate all the time about uh, which email software you should use um, and which uh, formatting software you should use. It really doesn't matter as long as you like it and it gets you the results that you need um, to move forward. So that's the main thing. So this is, these are the, the software and these are the tools that do that for me and I'm going to run through them all. So we're going to look at some uh, planning tools, plotting tools, writing tools. That's all actually the same tool and I'll show you that in a moment. Um, and then we'll look at what to do after you've written the book. So, you know, checking for grammar issues, um, getting covers done, formatting, exporting, um, and starting to build a, a website and an email list um, and do some kind of uh, market research and marketing stuff. I'm gonna take you through um, all of those and show you my favorite tools. Um, and I'll pop some links underneath the video for you to check them out. Um, some of them um, may be affiliate links, in which case if you buy through that link, then I do get a commission, uh, but I'll make sure that I label those for you so that you can see them. But again, I use all of these tools. I heartily recommend them um, and hopefully you find something that you like too. So um, let's go back to the home office, jump on the computer um, and I'll walk you through everything. All right, we're going to start with one of my favorite tools for uh, planning plotting, writing, exporting, formatting, fiddling around with words, and just generally anything to do with getting your book down on paper in some form. And that is Scrivener, which you can see on the screen here. And a lot of writers, whether they are new writers, aspiring writers, people who have never written but want to, um, and some uh, very experienced writers and authors um, still use something like Microsoft Word or Mac Pages or Open Office or some kind of word processor. Um, and I used to use that too. Um, and I would write my book out in very linear form and I would plan out different chapters and scenes and stuff all in Word. And um, it kind of got me by. But when I was introduced to Scrivener, it was kind of a game changer because this software allows you to have a lot more control over... Um, not just how your book looks when it's finished, but then also the entire planning process as well. Um, I like to plan out the book, so I get my, I come up with my idea. So it might be like um, Jaws in space, or I don't know, um, what if sharks were Jedi's, or something um, along those lines. You know, the idea, and then you can expand that idea out into something that can support a story which generally goes through um, sort of seven key phases, um, which I'll show you now. So one of the cool things about Scrivener is um, when you plan things out here, as you can see, I've got the, the new series plan is this section here. Um, so when I export this, all of this stuff won't be included. It'll just be the actual draft itself, which is um, this section here. So you can have also all of your front matter, like your copyright notice, table of contents. Uh, if you're offering people a free download to sign up to your mailing list, 
a reader magnet, then you can put that in there as well. You can just keep track of all the different sections. But this is just my rough draft of uh, one of my books. And this there's actually a, a better one um, after this. But this is the more rough one that I wanted to show you because this is what I started with. Um, and if we kind of scroll on up to um, the plan section, if we go on over to view corkboard, this is the cool bit and um, where you can start arranging your chapters. So one thing that a lot of authors do that is very cool is they'll use legal cards or post-it notes on a wall or on some kind of board um, or even they'll draw it out on a whiteboard or something to plan out their book. So when you've got this premise of, you know, it's, it's Jaws in space, you need to come up with them. Well, who's the uh, who's the protagonist, you know, the hero or the heroine? Um, who's the opposition, uh, the villain? So that would probably be the shark. Uh, but who's going to be the hero? So maybe it's just taking the story of Jaws and putting it in space. So the hero is going to be the small town sheriff. Maybe he becomes uh, a small planet sheriff or a moon sheriff or a starship captain. I don't know. It's kind of running away with me here. Uh, but then you've got the opposition is the shark. Um, and then uh, the, the shark wants to eat people. The hero wants the opposite to stop it from eating people. And that's where the conflict comes from. And the conflict is what drives the story. So what things have to happen for that conflict to raise the stakes and to make uh, the reader feel like the, the hero or the heroine is um, going to lose something, is going to kind of in peril in some way. Um, and that, if you can do that, is 90% of the difficult stuff done for coming up with story ideas um, and then what what I like to do is I then arrange um, scenes into seven different headings so we will have um, the premise which is what I just explained you know what the story is about but then what has to happen for this story to go from um, the beginning to the end and be interesting in the middle and that's where these seven stages come in. Um, and we've got the uh, the intro phase, which is where we're kind of introduced to the characters, their daily lives, what's normal for them. Um, and then a game-changing moment, you know, game-changing moment number one or GCM number one up here on the right-hand side. Um, that's when something happens that changes the protagonist's path. So the, the small town sheriff is no longer chasing chickens around, um, he now has to try and find out what's happened to this mutilated body that's shown up on the beach and he discovers it's a shark attack. So that's game-changing moment number one. Um, and then the third phase is the reactive phase, which is where the hero or heroine is sort of running around like a chicken with their head cut off, trying to figure out what's going on and what they might be able to do. So they're reacting to external forces. So that the small town sheriff is you know, trying to figure out where the shark is, um, what it's doing, where it's come from. And then usually there'll be some kind of um, conflict going on um, during that phase leading up to the next game changing moment number two, um, which there's another sort of uh, big shock to the system that gives our hero or heroine kind of the drive and the purpose to then move into uh, the proactive phase, which is where they can actually go and try and uh, work towards their goals. So the sheriff in game changing moment number two has maybe had um, a close run in with the shark and has realized that the shark you know, has a weakness or um, has a predictable pattern or something that means that in the proactive phase, the sheriff can then use that knowledge to try and achieve his goals against the wishes of the opposition, the shark. Uh, the final game-changing moment, number three, is when the hero gets the final piece of the puzzle, the last piece of information or the last ability or the last knowledge that they need to succeed. Um, so this might be, you know, they've got this awesome boat and they've gone out um, and they've managed to wound the shark um, and they know it's gone into hiding and they know where it's hiding. Um, so that's going to be game changing moment number three. They're going to go in the conclusion phase now to go and finish the shark off. And that's kind of a very simplistic way of breaking it down, but it's helpful and it allows you to then think about how you can take your idea and expand it into something that's a full narrative. So um, that's exactly what I've done here is I've come up with um, sort of scenes that have to happen. Um, and some of these scenes might be one chapter or they might be two or three chapters, depending on how long it runs for. Uh, but I've then color coded them. So um, I'll start with the intro phase of what has to happen for us to get to know the characters. 
then what's going to change? And then what's the hero going to do? How's he going to be running around? What bad things are going to happen to him? Uh, what's going to happen in the game changing moment? Number two, he's going to, he's going to find out something even worse is happening, but then he's going to be able to go into a proactive phase. What's going to happen there, etc., etc. And I like to do that. And then um, all of the scenes can then be put into those sections. So I've color coded it. Um, and what's cool about this is then, you know, if you've got all these scenes in your head, you might have 15 scenes in your head and you need another 10. Um, you can then add them in at the right place and you can take these and you can drag them around and you can move them around and you can do whatever you like. So maybe you think, well, actually, this is needs to be over here. Um, you can easily move that so that when you come to actually writing, all you have to do is refer back to your plan, your post-it notes, and you go, right, well, I know what I'm writing today. Uh, today I need to write the intro phase here and here's, uh, here's what it's all about. So you can fill this in uh, to say what's going to happen and then you'll be able to write it over here. And that's exactly what I've done. So um, this this card here uh, represents, I believe, um, chapters one through four of the book, more or less, or one through three. Um, and then that's kind of leads on till I get all the other chapters done as well. So these uh, these post-it notes here might, as I said, just be one chapter. It might be three chapters, uh, but it doesn't matter as long as you get them all in. And then the book sort of novel length by the time you finished, which was my goal, um, then you were all good to go. Um, and this really did help me nail down exactly what it was I was writing about. Because I remember when I used to use Word, I kind of I would have a very short bullet point list of things roughly that I wanted to happen. But then about half the time I'd get about halfway through the book and then I'd realize that all the stuff that's going to happen next um, hasn't been prepared for in the earlier scenes. So with, with a, any good narrative, you can't just introduce random stuff that has no explanation. You have to sort of hint at it and foreshadow it earlier on. And this is a great tool at being able to do this because you might get to maybe this stage here and think, well, in order for this person to be able to do X, Y, and Z, uh, we need to introduce them up here and then you can add it in. And then this is before you've even started writing chapter one so that by the time you've planned it all out, everything fits together and it all makes sense. And there's no randomness and there's no kind of tricky plot holes that you have to try and um, retroactively fill so that when you start writing chapter one, you know exactly what you're going to write. Or if you don't want to start chapter one, maybe that's not your favorite chapter. Maybe, you know, this scene here is your favorite chapter. You can absolutely just start writing here um, and then just dot around and see, well, I fancy writing this one today. I'll write this one tomorrow. Um, I'll write this one next week. And it doesn't matter what order you write them in because you know it all fits together. And Scrivener keeps it all nice and organized for you. So that's really cool. So that's one thing I really, really like about it. Um, and I use maybe 10% of Scrivener's potential. So I use it as a word processor. So I just type it out um, and it keeps all the chapters nicely separated for me. Um, and then I use it to plan and I use it to export into a nice clean word file too. Um, so that's really cool. Scrivener does do a lot more than just that. But from a sort of fiction narrative point of view, that's kind of all I really need it to do. So that's um, kind of my favorite tool. I think Scrivener is something like $40 for a one-off payment. Um, and it works on Mac and it works on PC. I think there's an app for it as well. And um, one really cool function as well that I use is the backup function. So if I save this, let's see if it does it. Let's save it. There it goes. That little box that popped up, um, it wasn't just saving it to my hard drive. It was also saving a backup version to another part of my hard drive. And it was also uploading um, the file to Scrivener's server so that I can then go on my laptop and open up Scrivener and it will know exactly where I got to even if I don't have the file. Um, and it prevents you from opening duplicates as well. So if you've got it open on one computer and then you open it up on another computer but it's not synced properly, um, it will tell you and say, hey, you might want to make a copy of this and work from that because actually you're going to overwrite some of the work you did, which is never good. So um, I have had on a couple of occasions um, my Word files explode on me and be lost and I've had to rewrite them. Uh, with Scrivener, that just doesn't happen. So that's really cool. And I also use... Um, iCloud as well, which is like a cloud storage system. So everything on this computer is also then able to access it from the laptop and the phone, and it all keeps in sync. So wherever I am in the world, I have this file. It's always the up-to-date one. It's like triple redundancy. It's all nicely laid out. 
And um, it's just it's just fantastic. And that's like a 10% of Scrivener's potential there. Um, and it's just, it does what I need. So it's really, really cool. Um, what you can do as well is when you finish writing the book, you can then export it as ebook files, um, which is really cool. So if you go to file and compile, it kind of rhymes, I like it. It should be like a Scrivener wrap or something. Uh, you can then export it as a paperback, uh, which is cool. So a Word file um, formatted to look perfect for paperbacks. Um, so you would then take the PDF version of that and put that into your KDP print or Ingram, whoever you're publishing with, you can use that file for that. Um, and also as an ebook file too. So you might want uh, the Mobi file for Amazon and the EPUB file for everyone else. Um, and then it's just a case of selecting what it is you want to be in the final um, exported file. So you don't want all of this planning stuff. You don't want all of the research that you might be doing, et cetera, et cetera. So I would select instead of all of it, which I don't want, um, I just want the first draft um, and all of those would go in. I'd click compile and it would spit out a Mobi file. Now that's one way of doing it. Um, I prefer using a different piece of software to export it as an ebook um, and it looks nicer and it's easier to use and it gives you more flexibility over how it looks. Um, and that tool is Vellum, V-E-L-L-U-M, and it's very, very cool. Um, and I'm gonna show you how to use that now as well, but it can only really read Word files. So you have to have a nice Word file for this to work. So what you would do in Scrivener is you would go to um, something like print, there it is. Um, and you would select the format you want. Doesn't really matter as long as it's a Word file um, and all the chapters are separated by headers, which they will be automatically. Um, I would just select paperback and compile it and then it would spit out a Word document and then you can work with it in Vellum, um, which is a really, really cool piece of software. Now Vellum, I'll show you in a second, um, I think is a couple of hundred dollars uh, for a lifetime license. So it's a bit more pricey. Uh, so if you don't wanna pay that and you wanna just fiddle around with Scrivener, it's a bit more fiddly to get it to look exactly how you want. And um, I won't go into that now because I'm not an expert. I don't use it for formatting these days. I much prefer Vellum, but it is possible. So you'd compile it, you would preview it, and you'd be good to go. But we're going to do it in Vellum. So I'm going to export this as a uh, Word file, and we will go from there. Quick interlude, because uh, not everyone's cut out to watch uh, 45 minutes of tutorials. And that's kind of what my goal is with this YouTube channel is... Um, authors have to learn a lot of stuff, and a lot of it is on the computer, and um, not everyone wants to sit through 20 to 40 minutes of screen shares. Um, shock horror, right? So um, my goal with this channel is to try and make it a little bit more interesting, and not just be some guy sat at a desk talking into a webcam. Um, so I'm coming out to get more shots of the horses, because the first time round, uh, it was just out of focus, and I now have this funky monitor so hopefully that'll help but we'll see uh what kind of shots we get okay so this is vellum um and this is showing um one of my books that has been imported as a word file um, and what we're going to do is we're going to import the one i just exported file and we're going to go to import word file and we're going to head on over um to where that book is if i can find it here we go this one is like the triple proofread version uh, so let's give that a go so let's import that here we are. Uh, so you can see it has already figured out all the chapters because Scrivener spat out some nicely, cleanly formatted Word file with proper chapter headings in there. Um, and you may want to change a few of these, but the, the default setting that I've got um, looks pretty nifty. So it's got uh, the chapter heading is just bold capital and it's got the first three words are capitalized and unindented. So this is kind of like the default look and it's a fiction book, so it's all text really. Um, so there's nothing too flashy about it. Um, I like just clean and simple formatting like this. Um, if, you're, if you've got nonfiction, um, there's some cool stuff you can do. So um, if you wanna include like um, images in there as well, that's absolutely something you can do in here. So what you would do is, I'm just gonna do something cool here. So what we would do is we would go to here, this little gear, and we could add um, some images at the header. Uh, we can add subtitles to um, the chapter headings as well. Um, or we can add um, images into uh, the actual book itself. So we need to go into where we want the image to go. Um, and then we have to uh, go into 
somewhere in here. Image, there it is. So we would then import an image. Um, so let's just randomly stick the cover in for no reason whatsoever. Um, and there it is. So uh, you can then preview that in here by just flipping through. So this is what it's going to look like when it's been exported, which is really cool because normally to preview uh, an ebook, you would need to get the Kindle previewer and download that. And it's a separate tool, uh, which isn't that big a deal, but it just, it's a bit slow to load. It's a bit of a pain. Um, and I'm a fan of easy workflow. Uh, so there it is. So there's the image. Um, and if you wanted it to be sort of uh, within the text itself, so if you've got nonfiction, for example, you might have a lot of images sort of within the text. Um, you can do that in here as well. And you can see that it's formatted it properly so that it fits on the page. So if we want to make it super small, maybe have some text wrapping around it, um, then that's something that you can do as well. Uh, so there we go. Um, so if you if you do nonfiction, you've got lots of pictures. Um, this is a nice way of doing it. Now, you don't have the same level of control that you would do if you were kind of designing a physical book in maybe InDesign or something where you could have, uh, you could control the exact layout. Um, but that's actually a good thing because the way e-readers work, it's very standardized. So if you introduce anything too fancy, um, it might look great on your device, but then someone else's device, it might look awful. Um, and that's what's good about this is it only gives you the options that are kind of going to look good. Um, and you can you can change um, some of these things up here as well. So you can flip through um, the different chapters. Um, you can preview it on different devices if you want. This one's stuck on uh, Kindle Fire right now, but you can change that. Um, I think you click on this one here. So on the paper white, uh, it looks like this. So it's, it emulates the look of it quite nicely. Look, so you can see it's dropped the resolution, it's dropped the brightness, um, which is cool. Uh, and then iPhone, again, it's gonna look different once more. There it is. Um, so you've noticed that is causing a problem now. So there's a big break there. So I can see that can be easily fixed. And it updates itself pretty quickly, the preview does, which is nice. Uh, but yeah, that's how I'd want it to look. So you can see the difference there between the, uh, the Kindle Fire. So there's more resolution, there's more real estate to play with. It wraps around, uh, whereas on the um, iPhone, it doesn't, and that's a good thing, because if it tried to wrap around, it would just look horrific. Um, and then there's other ones, Android tablets and all kinds of things that you can play with on here. So um, it just makes life a little bit easier. So that's how you do images, and then you can get rid of those, add captions, um, do whatever you like. Um, and then one of the things that you can do as well um, across the entire document is if you, if you don't really like this simple style, um, you can change it. So uh, one thing is, some people would use like um, line breaks if uh, if there was a change in the scene. So it might look like that. Then you can emulate that um, in the uh, styles tab just here. So you go in here and you could just choose the look that you want. So um, that's quite nice for nonfiction, I think. A little bit weird for fiction. Um, so I might go with this one is very clean. I like that one. Um, that's quite fancy, sort of a romance style. Um, if I head back to chapter one as well, it'll give you a better idea. So there, see, sort of like the romance script, which doesn't really fit what I'm doing. <laughs> so uh, what else can we find in there? So there's some historical style. Uh, that's a lot more sci-fi. Um, I'd actually be very tempted to use that one. I may actually just go in and redo it as that font, because that's cool. Uh, yeah, some more in here, some more in here. That's kind of funky. Uh, for, for nonfiction. Uh, you don't have much control over this and that's kind of on purpose. If you want to have like extreme control over everything, um, then you'll want to get a designer to do it from scratch. But I personally think simple is better. Uh, so you can change the ornamental breaks as well. So those three asterisks I showed you earlier, um, then they would turn up as a little square in that case, or asterisks, or a flurry thing, a line, uh, a sharper line, snowdrop. Um, I would probably go with sharp line. I like sharp line. So I would keep that one. Uh, paragraphs after a break. So it gives you a little preview of your actual book here if you don't have it up on the screen. Um, so you can change this as well. So you might want um, one or two of the first words uh, or a few words um, capitalized. Personally, I don't. I like to do that at the beginning of a chapter, but I would leave it um, just as it is. So with the first paragraph, I would have it 
with a bit of a fanciness to it. And you can do that if you prefer. You can do that. You can change lots of things. You leave it alone. Um, but I like the uh, sort of first few words to be capitalized. I think it's quite nice. And then you can change how photographs look. So the one I did earlier, I could have it look with a bit of a shadow on it, uh, an outline around it, um, a big gray border around it, and a shadow border. I'm just going to leave it plain. Then headers and footers, I could just leave those alone. Um, and then the body, you could say if you want it justified, hyphenation, indentation, and all that stuff. Uh, but as you can see, you know, I imported it, and it's it's all there. You know, the, the title page copyrights there, contents will be automatically inserted, which is cool, and that will displace for you right there. And then if you want to include anything else. So I would add in my reader magnet page, which would go in here and say, you know, if you want to sign up for my email list, I'll send you the next book free, um, you know, and you can join my review team and you can leave me nice reviews and everything's lovely. You grow your email list at the same time as selling your books, which is always awesome. Um, so you just want to change a few things. So I wouldn't necessarily want to call this untitled. I might want to call it um, summary of the book or something. That's not particularly sexy either. Um, you can opt to just completely hide that. And now that's gone. Um, so that's up to you as well. And you can change how this works too. So chapter one, five minutes ago, but then the other chapters are written out. So I might then take the numbering off like that one, um, and then I would type this one in here. So chapter one, a subtitle, which would be about five minutes ago. There we go. So that's how I'd want it to look, um, and I would just do that for the first three where they do have a subtitle. Um, so this particular style I've chosen um, doesn't do that for me, uh, but you saw with the some of the other styles, it kind of did. So... That one, for example, um, had the number in. Uh, some of them don't. So you might want to just check through your styles and make sure you're happy. Um, but yeah, so otherwise you can just manually change it. Um, and as you saw, you know, it's like been five minutes of fiddling and it's pretty much ready to go. Um, so this file has been proofread, edited, fiddled with, tinkered, rewritten, proofread again, <laughs> and all that stuff. I've fiddled with it to make it look the way I want. Um, and it is going to look like this when it's exported. I've seen the previewer. Um, so then all I have to do now is then um, export it. So you click on generate books. Um, you might want to save it. Um, this is just a draft, so I'm going to ignore that bit. Um, and then you can choose which formats you want it to be. So if you're just on Amazon, just do Kindle. Otherwise, um, you can choose all of these ones and then you can sell that book on any store ever. Um, and if you want to buy the upgrade for print, um, that's like an extra hundred and something dollars. And then you can create nice paperbacks with it. Uh, but to be honest, so far, Scrivener has done such a fantastic job of paperbacks. Um, that I'm not too worried, uh, but that's, a, that's a, something that you might consider as well is adding the paperback print version to Vellum. Uh, but for now, I just use it as an ebook exporter and I will generate in a folder here and it goes zip 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 and more or less done there it is and then all you have to do is then upload it to the stores and that's my favorite formatting tool vellum which is unfortunately only available for the mac now this is something that always makes me laugh because um i know a few authors who've told me that they have purchased a mac um, oftentimes a second-hand one, an old one, they've sort of bought off a friend or something, but they bought a Mac just so they can use Vellum because it saves them so much of a headache versus the other software options that it's worth it for them. Um, it may not be worth it for you, but I wanted to show you what, in my opinion, is the best software, Vellum, show you how easy it is, how good it looks when you're finished with it, um, so that you can kind of compare that to what other options are out there. Now, it is probably the most expensive tool, um, but it's still a lot cheaper than paying a formatter to do it for you. And it doesn't take long. So it's a great alternative to having to pay someone $100, $150 a pop to format the book. So um, it's done. And as long as you've got a clean Word file, which you can get from Scrivener, then you can use it. If you don't have a Mac and you've got no intention of getting a Mac, you don't want to use Vellum. You can do the, uh, the export compile feature in Scrivener um, works absolutely fine as well. You just want to definitely preview it first um, and tinker with some of the settings because it might not look quite as smart as this, um, but it's still good and it will still work. I mean, that's the main thing. So 
getting the right tools that do the job that you like is the important thing. So you don't have to use what I'm suggesting. But Vellum, to me, is absolutely fantastic. One other tool I want to show you now, um, and in another video, we're going to look at some other tools that we can use for kind of marketing stuff. So growing email lists um, and all that lovely stuff when you've got your book going to be published, you're doing a launch, you're doing a promo. Talk about that in a separate video because it's been going on for a while already. I want to show you one more tool, which probably I should have shown you before, Vellum, um, but this is a proofreading tool. And if you're anything like me, when you've written your first draft, and actually after every sentence I do this, I go back and I look at it and go, oh, it's not quite right. That slows me down. Um, so what I like to do is try and do as much of it at the end as I can. And that saves me a whole lot of time. Um, and the cleaner and more error-free the document that I send to my editor, the better it will be for everybody because it won't take him as long to go through it all. Probably won't cost me as much. And then the edited file that I get back to implement is going to be much cleaner too. So that when it goes to like the last round where it gets proofread after I've done any rewrites and tweaks, then there's fewer errors for the proof writer, uh, for the proof reader to catch because they can never catch them all. Um, they're like Pokemon. Um, these errors, they, they creep up on you. You can't catch them all. Um, so you may even need to have one or two proofreaders go through it. Um, but so far, thankfully, I've only had to use one because I use a tool um, much like this, which is Pro Writing Aid. Um, they're quite new for me. I've just started using them. Previously, I just relied on kind of Scrivener's spell check, um, which is currently set to American English. Yeah! This book is actually British English. Your mind is so placid, straightforward, barely used. Um, and then I decided to go back to American English again afterwards. So it doesn't like all the extra use. Um, but with Pro Writing Aid, uh, it's a bit more, uh, it's a bit more sophisticated. So I'm going to show you what the free version can do, and then you can decide if you want to use it as well. Now they have a web editor, and they have a app as well that works on. I think it's both Mac and PC. Integrates with Microsoft Office, so you can use it with Word. You can have a browser extension so it works with stuff you're writing on your browser. Uh, and it's a little bit like Grammarly, but it's kind of more aimed at authors. So Grammarly is very much like, you know, oh, I'm a, a business. I'm at work. <laughs> I'm at business. I'm at work and I need to write this email to my boss, but it doesn't sound great. Grammarly is cool for that. But I think Pro Writing Aid is for people who write long form stuff, novels, non-fiction books, you know, longer stuff, and they want an extra kind of layer between them and the editor to make sure it's clean and error-free. So the web editor, I'll show you this now. This is the free version. Um, so it will check the first 500 words of any document. So you can just do it in 500 word chunks if you want. If you have the full version, um, and I have played with this, it's quite fun, um, is you can take the entire book from Scrivener and you can paste it in to um, Pro Writing Aid, and it will check the whole book. Now, Grammarly, I think, tops out at a certain word count. I can't remember what it is, um, but with Pro Writing Aid, you can stick the whole book in there, and it will check everything. It does kind of slow your computer down, um, but you can do it, and it's really fun. Um, but I'm not going to do that today. I'm going to take the first chapter, um, and I'm going to show you what it does. Now, this is um, this has been spell checked and gone over and tweaked. Um, so there shouldn't really be that many errors in. Um, so we're going to see what Pro Writing Aid makes of it. So I paste that in, uh, and then we have to give it a little bit of time just to kind of do its calculations, um, and then it's going to show us some cool stuff. So if I click on uh, Real Time, then it will start flagging things up. So we're just going to leave it for about a minute and see what happens. Okay, so that was about 30 seconds, roughly. Um, it's found 15 potential errors. I'm sure it will find more, uh, but we can start going through these now. So grammar, we can start with, um, and you can, you can go through it manually and just hover over uh, the mistake that it finds, and it will suggest. So it's asking if I should use a question mark. Uh, in this case, no, I should not. So we can ignore that one. Uh, this one here, Yes, I suppose that is fairly lazy, but this is a very conversational book, um, so I wouldn't worry too much about that one. Uh, but yeah, go through, I think a fair amount of them you can ignore, uh, but it does pick up on sort of awkward, awkward language. So what we'll do here is go to the style issues it's found. So it's found readability enhancements in blue, passive verbs in red. 
So let's have a look at that one. Um, emergency medical protocols have been initiated. So let's have a look at this one. So that's down here. Ah, there it is. So we can click this button um, and go to it, which is very useful. There it is. So yes, yeah, so this is um, the, the computer in our hero's head uh, talking to him, um, saying that emergency medical protocols have been initiated. Um, a better way of saying that would be, I have initiated emergency medical protocols. Um, and I think probably that's better. So what I'm going to do is swap that out. Boom, done. So I'm happy with that one. Other ones, um, our powered armor was designed. Let's see what it says about that one. Yeah, so they designed our power armor to keep us alive, I think is, is much better. So let's do that one. Um, so they designed our power armor to keep us alive, which I think is a stronger sentence. So that's good so far. Um, nothing else massively. So adverbs, it doesn't like adverbs very much. Let's have a look at these ones. Literally, obviously, especially, exactly, subjectively, objectively. Um, I know that those are fine because uh, they're relevant to the story. Um, and we can have a look at the index there. So it's saying two passive verbs um, out of 100 by 41 sentences. I don't really know what that one means, uh, but apparently I'm green, so I'm happy. Um, so that's really, really cool. Now in settings, uh, we can change a few things here. So the writing style for me is quite conversational. So I might change that to casual um, and see if that makes any difference to the checking. And I've put it as general English as well. So it's going to pick up on American and British spellings. Uh, but this is British. So I'm going to choose British in there um, and then go back to where we were. Uh, and it's going to go and check it again for me. Um, and I can go to the summary and it will just tell me everything about the uh, the section that I've uploaded, which is kind of funky. So there you go. It's given me 78 out of 100. Um, <laughs> mostly because it hates my style. Oh, it hates it. Uh, so it's saying I'm using a lot of filler words. I can reduce those ones. So there we go. So, I mean, that's kind of based a lot on more technical writing. Uh, I've dropped it down to casual style. Um, that seems to make a bit of a difference. Uh, so fiction is always going to be a little bit difficult to pick up on uh, because there's no rules about the style of writing. Um, so as long as it makes sense. I found a couple of ones that I wanted to make stronger, which is really cool. Um, and you can also look for overused words too. So it was adverbs could and had potentially. So you could go through each one of those and see, is there a different word that I could use there? Um, and then you can click on combo and it'll kind of give you a combined uh, breakdown of all the stuff it thinks you might want to have a look at. So there it is. So the bad things, uh, it doesn't like my diction very much. <laughs> Never mind. Let's see what it says about this one. Um, so... But, no, that makes no sense. Uh, with, uh, you should you should not end sentences with, 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 which I've just done. But whatever, that works for me. It's conversational narrative, so I don't really mind. Vague and abstract words. Um, yeah, again, if this was a more formal, so I'm saying objectively a little over four seconds had passed. Absolutely fine if you're speaking. So this whole book is basically dialogue, which kind of screws up some of the grammar reporters a little bit. Um, but where I do like it is where it finds the passive verbs, um, and you can go and change them up, and where it finds repeated words, um, which is really funky too. Um, readability enhancements. So yeah, so initiated, right? This is an example here. It's something that a computer would say, um, but a real human would probably say started which is absolutely right. But in my case, it's computer talking, so I would ignore those. So this is this is the cool thing about Pro Writing Aid is you don't have to listen to it, um, but it will point out stuff that is at risk of spoiling your writing, which is the main thing. So you can then spend 15 minutes going through, you know, a chapter or two chapters um, and find any issues that you agree with. So a spelling issue, Dove. Let's see what it says about that one. Um, yeah, so this is an American thing. And uh, so in, in British English, you say, I dove for the floor. Um, in American English, I believe, dived um, or the other way around. I can't remember, but I will look it up and I will change it if it's required. So this is the kind of stuff it picks up on. 
I can't even remember the difference between US English and British English these days. I've been writing in both for so long, it all mingles together. Uh, but yeah, this is what I would pick up on. Um, and then I would change the things um, that I think are worth changing. Um, and that would then go off to the editor and he would come back with his suggestions on anything that needs to be improved or tightened up. I would implement those suggestions if I agreed with him, which I do, because if I don't, then he'll shout at me. Um, and then that version will then maybe even go through this again and then go to a proofreader, come back, and we'll probably go through a simple spell check just to make sure. Um, and then that will be exported from Scrivener um, into Vellum. And I will end up with a beautiful looking ebook, which I can then export and it's ready to publish. And those are my three favorite tools for anybody who has a book idea. If you have an idea, you can turn it into a book. You know, I will link to some videos underneath this one where I'll help you take ideas and turn them into books. Load of free stuff for you. Um, these are my three favorite tools to get your book actually out there and ready to publish. And in subsequent videos, we're going to look at the other tools. We're going to look at how do you publish. So I'm going to be starting a pre-order for this very book that you are looking at on the screen. It is ready to go. I could publish it now, but the book coming after it is not going to be ready until mid-December, which is a couple of months away. So I'm going to put this book that you're seeing on pre-order. I'm going to show you how to do it, how to fill in all the settings, the different choices that you have to make, and everything you need to know about pre-orders, getting a book published, and all the stuff you need to have in place. Um, and then we will also be looking at the marketing side as well. So make sure you have clicked the subscribe button, hit that notification bell, we will make sure that you get everything delivered to your inbox on your YouTube home screen, and I'll take you through everything. But for now, this is everything you need to get all those words out of your head and into some form of book. And I'll be back again with you very, very soon with the rest. Right, back at the computer, check the footage. Looks pretty good, but yeah, it's just, oh, it's so slow. No, the computer cannot handle it. So we have this new one which I haven't opened yet because basically it's going to take me at least half a day to set everything up and uh, we'll talk about that in another video and we'll look at the specs and we'll talk about you know what kind of computer do you need do you need beast mode computer or can you get by with something uh, simpler so obviously it depends on your goals uh, but we're going to unbox that beast machine put it together and um, see how we get on so that's it from me today until next time so if you want to get the next tools video we're gonna look at some marketing stuff we're gonna look at websites and email and all that lovely stuff to get launched uh, make sure you hit the subscribe button hit the notification bell and I'll make sure um, that you get the next video as soon as it's ready so uh, back to the old computer hopefully it doesn't explode on me and I will see you very soon <laughs>